Hey there, Sam Visnick here, Release Muscle Therapy. In this video, I wanna talk about why your psoas is not releasing. It is 2020, and as of now, it is amazing. I've been in this field for about 20 years. Um, every few years, there's a new musculoskeletal boogeyman, and it continues to, for a long time, for being the uh, champion over and over again every year, is definitely the psoas. So, the psoas muscle, I'm sure you're already familiar with this because you're looking for how to actually get it to stay released is a hip flexor muscle. It connects the lumbar spine, all five vertebrae, to the inside of the femur bone in the groin area. Classically, we think about it as a hip flexor like this, but it has a super important stabilizer function of the spine as well. I don't wanna to dive too deep into the anatomy components of it because I think some of that is arguable um, and some people have different philosophies on the exact role of the psoas. But in particular, why I made this video is because of just a fatigue level of seeing constantly tons of information about the psoas, in particular, psoas being the root cause of all of these different problems and uh, low back pain, hip problems, and so forth. And the second issue is, is the preposterous mechanisms for which people are going through in order to get the psoas to release. Now, first and foremost, the name of my company is Release Muscle Therapy. I chose that for a reason because people are familiar with the term and so forth, but let's talk about what causes muscle tension. Muscles are generally dumb. They just kind of lay there. They don't do much. They're told what to do essentially, or to contract, should I say, based upon electrical impulses, that is through the nerves. So let's first and foremost get this out of the way. Muscle tension is determined by your nervous system. Okay, so we increase muscle tone, we reduce muscle tone, if we wanna put it that way, based upon your nervous system telling those muscles what to do. So when we're dealing with a chronic muscle tension problem, we have to think about the nervous system. If we think about a muscle as just being a muscle by itself, then we oftentimes will start using techniques and tools and so forth that treat muscles uh, as, an, as a sole entity. And one of those things that we see is a lot of tools, big plastic tools that look like a fork where you're gonna dr drive them down into your abdomen, my say is probably sounds not like a great idea to try to force that muscle to relax or to do super aggressive massage therapy to try to break up adhesions and so forth. And these ideas don't even make sense because we know that from a neurological standpoint, that is not how things work. So if you've tried these gizmos and you've done something to the effect of what we call interruption or neuromodulation, and it's caused that muscle to relax and you got more range of motion, that's great. There were probably a lot of techniques that would have done that, and they don't need to be invasive hardly at all. But if you're dealing with a constant psoas tension or a hip flexor tension problem, and you're not getting the result that you want out of it, then let's talk a little bit further about this. First and foremost, people have not been assessed properly in their hip flexors. For 20 years, I see anywhere from six to eight people every day uh, with musculoskeletal complaints and issues as a clinical massage therapist. I evaluate people. Everybody and their brother and their mother has been told that their psoas is tight. But oftentimes when I ask, did you actually have a test done for the psoas? Most people say, no, I don't recall that. So oftentimes it's just this kind of blanket term or a diagnostic situation where people are like, you got a tight psoas, you got a tight psoas. It's never actually been tested. I can also tell you that most clinicians don't know how to properly assess hip function in a lot of different uh, ways, looking at different uh, planes of motion, triplanar activity and so forth. So they really don't have the skill to properly assess whether or not the psoas is, pro is, is a problem. I see this very frequently. So a lot of times I end up dismissing this because once I test the psoas, we find that the psoas is maybe a little bit short, maybe a little bit what we call hypertonic, has increased muscle tension in it, but it is usually not the problem. Okay, so first and foremost, just assume, have you had, first of all, have you had a proper assessment done? There's some videos on my YouTube page you can check out for that. So that is an important one. The next thing is, is, un, is uh, uncovered, uh, non-covered or, or nobody has looked under the hood, should I say, wow, that was hard to get out, about underlying pathology usually in the hip or in the lumbar spine, but a lot of times it's a hip. If there's an undiagnosed labral tear or there's something going on with the hip that is pathological at the joint level, then that psoas muscle may have increased muscle tone in it in order to guard or protect the area. So this is really, really important. So you can stretch that thing all day long, you can you know, dig that piece of plastic in there all you want, and it's gonna last a few seconds, if anything at all, because the body is trying to protect that area, okay, that joint, it's not going to release, all right? So you have to look at underlying pathology if there's a recurrent problem with the psoas. 
Now let's say that there is no underlying pathology, x-ray MRI looks good, it's been ruled out, and you're dealing with this constant muscle tension problem. Now let's go to the next idea. The next idea is, is that we talked about muscle tension is driven by the nervous system, so you have increased tone in that muscle, but my question is, what are all the other muscles in that area doing? Now, to explain this and to give a little bit more uh, context into this, I'm going to talk about something that's called postural restoration, okay, the PRI system, Postural Restoration Institute, I found to be very helpful in understanding some of these compensatory activities that can occur in the body and explain some of these recurrent muscle tension problems that are not based upon simple things like what we just talked about. Now, the idea is postural asymmetry. Now, number one, having asymmetry in the human body is completely normal. We have a heart on one side, we have a liver on the other side, our hemispheres are a little different in our brain, and we're right or left-handed. So there are some stuff that's natural in the body. So if we're dealing with a chronic muscle tension problem, number one, we have to understand how much of that is normal, right? And then we're looking at if the psoas or the hip problem is actually, you know, contributing to a mechanical problem that's increasing pain or discomfort or reducing uh, optimal movement performance, different animal, okay? So always make sure we look at it through this lens. So the issue that we oftentimes find, and let's use the right-handed person as an example, a right-handed person is often lateralized in their posture favoring their right side. So what that oftentimes means, and I don't want to make this, this video uh, you know, an hour long because it would take a long time to go through all of this, but when a person is lateralized to the right, their body weight shifts to the right. Now you don't do that in just one plane of motion. It's across three, sagittal, transverse, and frontal. So there's twists and turns that go with that. So with the classic model that we're talking about here, the pelvis tends to tip forward and a little bit more to the right to favor that right side weight bearing. Now if my pelvis tips forward, most people are familiar with that being contributing to increased tension in the hip flexor muscles. Okay, fair enough. So you would stretch your hip flexors on both sides. But what if the pelvis is going forward and rotating to the right? So now we're talking about a frontal and a transverse plane activity that's going on with the posture and the alignment. If my pelvis goes forward to the right, I don't walk like this. I rotate, I counter rotate my midsection or my spine toward the middle to walk straight ahead. If my pelvis is going this way, okay, I still have to walk straight ahead. My left leg is going to be relatively laterally or externally rotated, okay, relative to the right. So now we've got hips that are doing different things. My right hip is going to be internally rotated. My left one's going to be laterally rotated. Now the key piece and where I'm going out of this, if you look at the psoas, now the psoas connects to the five vertebrae, but it also connects to the inside of the hip. So not only does the hip flexor do, uh, or the uh, psoas do hip flexion, but contributes to a little bit of lateral rotation is more in line with the muscle. So the psoas on the left, when my pelvis is rotated like this, is now going to be doing a lot of work trying to keep that body straight to deal in a compensatory activity. Okay? Now, that's complicated. There's a lot of stuff in there and there's a lot to unpack. But the point I want to make with this is, if you're in that situation for a lot of different reasons, it could be because of breathing, it could be because of neck, occlusion imbalances in your jaw and so forth, you're situating your body that way. Your body is doing exactly what it needs to do in order to balance itself. And that may include increasing the tension in that psoas, okay, on your left side. Now, if you keep bludgeoning that thing with tons of stretches and aggressive massage work, you know, plastic things inserted in there, pushing in it, trying to get a myofascial release, how well is that going to work? The psoas is just a compensatory muscle. It's going to tighten right back up again because your nervous system knows what it's doing. So if we step back and we look at that entire situation and do an integrated evaluation to look at what the body is doing, you may find that by addressing some of those muscle tension problems elsewhere in the body, you can restore a more asymmetrical pattern of movement, and then guess what happens to that psoas tension? Presto changeo, it actually starts to relax, and then you get a negative test on that psoas uh, tension test finding, okay? So we can't just look at the psoas and think about it as an isolated unit. You can't just look at the pelvis and think about it as an isolated unit. 
you've got muscles that go all the way down to the floor and all the way up to your teeth and your eyes, which determine where you are in space and how you use your body. And if you're not looking at that, or your practitioner, I should say, then you're going to be at a loss for why a simple stretch doesn't work or, shall we say, 500 million glute bridges or glute squeezes trying to force that psoas muscle to relax. It isn't going to work. Now, I'm not saying you can't get symptom relief by doing those things because pain is complicated. Human bodies are meant to compensate a lot. And if we do a lot of stuff to try to improve our resiliency in that distorted pattern, then a lot of times people will get pain relief. There's lots of elite athletes with a huge pelvic tilt, tons of extension in their back, forward head postures, all of this kind of stuff. And they tolerate it quite well. Doesn't mean they're as mechanically efficient as they could be. But my point is, you can get people to move much better, and it's a faster way a lot of time of res resolving some of these chronic tension problems, right? You could also just put on a lot of strength on top of that area and make it easier to deal with that situation, and that can result in pain relief as well. So I want to make sure that we separate those concepts too, because I don't want to make everybody think that by making your movement perfect and your posture perfect, that's the only way to get out of pain, because that isn't necessarily true at all, okay? So I'm going off on a tangent there, but my point is I see so many videos about all these different psoas techniques, and the reality is you need a proper assessment. You need to go and look at underlying pathology and rule that stuff out. And then the other part is to do, look at everything else around it. And if we look at everything else around it and understand why your body's doing what it's doing, we can get an idea of why that psoas is maintaining tension. If it is, through proper assessment, we determine that it is actually tight. Okay, so we got to look at all those other factors in order to get long-term results with a psoas that we want to stay at an optimum length and improve function. So I hope that's helpful there. Apologies for the rant, but it's something that was driving me a little batty lady seeing all these uh, different videos out there. Okay, Sam Visnick here, Release Muscle Therapy. Make sure you comment below. I appreciate you for watching. Click the like button and make sure you're subscribed to the channel for upcoming videos.